So um, thank you all for coming, and this is Deborah Fields from the Sojourner Family Truth Center, and um, the the family excuse me Sojourner Family Peace Center because two organizations merged a couple of years ago. Uh, they started in 1975 as a task force on battered women, and I'm familiar with it from the Marquette Volunteer Legal Clinic at the Milwaukee Justice Center. The fact that um, we can send people up to the location, I think, on the seventh floor to get restraining orders, basically. If some of the clients that came in to see us for legal advice felt unsafe, we had a resource right there at the courthouse. But there's been a lot of exciting stuff going on um, with the organization in terms of the new building and all of the services that they are able to provide in this new building. It's, it's pretty exciting stuff. Uh, so, why don't you go ahead, Deborah? Good morning. Good morning. I actually hold two positions with Sojourner Family Peace Center. I'm their community education and prevention coordinator. So I go out and I do a lot of speaking and talking. And as I tell people, I talk to the littlest kids, whatever the first K is. I, I thought, well, when I was when I was growing up, it was like K4, K5. Then I heard there's a K3. Now I think there's a K2. I'm not quite sure, but it's like, OK, but whatever the first K is, I go out and talk to those little ones as well. As well as I go out and I talk to the public at large, professionals and non-professionals, all about domestic violence and abuse. And then I also hold the position of working with those individuals who are the people that do the hurting. We have a program called Beyond Abuse. It's a batterers intervention program. Now, a lot of people understand about people who are victims. But the way, what we try to explain as a Journal Family Peace Center is, you know, without help for those people who are the offenders, we will continue to have victims. We can help those individuals who are the victims of domestic abuse and violence. We can help them to get into a, get into a better place. But if you don't help the person who is the hurting, the person that's doing the hurting, then you still wind up with people being victimized. Another trend that we're starting to see is more women as offenders. This is why, for me, talking about domestic abuse and violence is so important. It is critical because things are changing, and the way we used to look at domestic violence is so different now. The way we used to look at it was the idea of a married couple in which the husband tended to be the person who was hurting his wife. But it is so different now. It is so different now. And if we don't begin to really look at how things are now, we will continue to see an increase in people who are victims. What we're also looking at is the children who are raised in homes where there's abuse going on. And the reality is, it's a tough subject. It's a hard subject. But so are many other things that people talk about. Alcoholism, uh, all the different addictions. We've been able to come to a point with all of those things that we can have conversations around those. And now it's time to be able to have a conversation about domestic abuse and violence. Because too many lives are being impacted. The time when we will all talk about it is when we hear of situations like the Azana Spa shooting. And then we're all having a conversation. Oh, how sad for that family. Oh, too bad for this person. But we need to be talking about it long before that. The Center for Disease Control says teen dating violence has reached epidemic proportion. Young people getting into relationships in which they're hurting each other. I go to all the schools and talk to young people. I go to the college campuses. Date rape on college campuses is one of the most terrible social issues that they're dealing with because young people are becoming victims and offenders, and it's having an incredible impact on their lives. Incredible. We've got to be able to have the conversation in order to save lives. So for me, going out and talking to people about what domestic violence is, who victims are, who offenders are, what it looks like, it's critical because we're making a difference. And it can only happen when we're willing to have those conversations. Because at any point in time, and I always say, for me, an audience is always like I'm talking to first responders. Because at any point in time, somebody can say to another person, I'm in a relationship where someone's hurting me. And then what do you do about it? We think of church as the safe place to go, as the place where things have happened. We come together as Christians, we fellowship with one another, we share good things with one another, but there are people sitting in our pews who are hurting. There are people in our pews who are hurting. And we must be willing to be open and have conversations and be in a place 
a position to be able to help. When I say things are different, the first shelters started to open up on the, on the West Coast. And those were people opening up their homes for women who were on the run. And they needed a safe place to go because they were in a terrible situation where the battery, the abuse was so horrendous. But over time, things started to change and we started opening up shelters. Wisconsin opened up their first shelter in the 1980s. Sojourner Family Peace Center, at the time it was Sojourner Truth House, <coughs> opened up the second shelter. We take in currently anywhere from four to 500 women and children a year who are living in abusive situations. And they're coming from all communities. They're coming from all communities, not just your urban, your cities and things like that. They're coming from your real rural areas. They're coming from your suburbs. I had a lady say to me one time, I was speaking at the um, junior league, and I had the lady come up to me, and she was an older woman, and she said, Deborah, do those young women ever ask you to come and speak to them? And I said, well, no, they've never invited me so far. She said, well, they really need to, because there are things going on in their homes that they don't want to talk about. But see, we have to talk about it. How else will we solve the problem? How else will we be able to deal with it? How else will we make an issue? be able to take this issue and turn it around. Because if we don't, the consequences are great. Children are being removed from homes. Laws keep getting made that we're not aware of. And things are happening and we don't understand it because we're not talking, we're not educating enough the whole community. Not just the people involved, not just the systems involved, but the whole community, all of society. So how do we, as Sojourner Family Peace Center, address this issue of domestic abuse and violence? First and foremost, we have a shelter, 48-bed facility, located right in Milwaukee. Um, there are several shelters, but there are actually only two shelters that are domestic violence safe houses. Sojourner Family Peace Center, the house is called Sojourner Truth House, and they're community advocates. So families who are dealing in domestic abuse and violence who need a safe place to go, that's, those are the two places that are primarily serving those families and individuals. And then we have the hotline, that 24-hour domestic violence hotline that operates and serves all of Milwaukee County and the surrounding communities. Why is that important? Not everybody needs to be in a shelter. But many people are in relationships where things are just not going quite right. Where things, people are saying terrible things to each other, being hurtful to each other, and they need help and they need help. That hotline is available not only to women, but to men as well, and it's anonymous. Anyone can call. I always say to people, please, if you don't know anything else, at least know this number, so that if someone is talking to you and they're describing to you a situation that is unhealthy, that is making them unhappy, they can call the number. They can talk to somebody. That's how you can help. That's the one thing any of us can do, is be able to give them a place someone that they can talk to. They don't have to share their name unless they want to. <clears throat> but it's an opportunity for people to be able to get talk to someone who can help them in terms of what are their needs as they're dealing with this relationship. So we offer a shelter, a 24-hour hotline. Um, Pam mentioned the restraining order clinic. So Journey Family Peace Center actually runs the restraining order clinic. Anybody know what the restraining order is? Yeah, a couple hands, by the way. Share with me. I hate just talking at me. <laughs> <laughs> so what, to your knowledge, what is the restraining order? What, what have you heard about what the restraining order is? Keeps the abuser a safe distance from the abusee. Okay, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Now, is a restraining order only for a woman against a man? No, no. <laughs> Pardon? I wouldn't think so. No. But do you know, if you, when you're listening to people talk in the public, that's the assumption a lot of people make, is that only women take out restraining orders. But absolutely not, because we know, we absolutely know, that there are men who are victims of domestic abuse and violence as well. And this is the other kicker. When I talk about how things change, and I mentioned that domestic abuse and violence used to be about a, a couple who were married and the husband was the perpetrator, it's so different now. We now have elder abuse, Mm -hmm. And it was really, 
when I got my first AARP magazine, I was so excited. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was really excited. The reason being is because as a kid, you remember the kids always get all these discounts and things. And yeah. So when you're a kid, your mom saved money and stuff like that. It used to be till at 12, now it's down to two even. And then I'm thinking, okay, as soon as I turn 60, I'm gonna get discounts, or no, 55, I'm gonna start getting discounts and everything. And then my husband says, not on everything, dear, just on some things. <laughs> That's okay, I'm getting close, I'm getting close. But my first AARP magazine had a story of a woman who was a survivor of domestic abuse and violence. This woman in her first marriage, which was about 35 years, and it was a wonderful marriage, <clears throat> but her husband passed away. And after some time, she met someone and she remarried. And she, this person she remarried was someone who hurt her a lot, did some horrendous things to her, smashed her arm in the car door, slapped her, hit her, and she never shared it with anyone. She never told anyone. And she said the reason why she didn't is because she felt that at her age, people would say, you should have known better. You had a wonderful marriage, that first marriage, and you get into this situation, and you and she really felt so much guilt and so much shame that she never told anyone. And so she suffered in silence. But the man eventually suffered a, a, a grave disability. He didn't die, he suffered a grave disability. And she still stayed with him. She still took care of him. But it is the idea that even our our seasoned, mature adults experience unhealthy relationships. And the same things that we think about young people, all of these people can go through. We have situations where we talk about cultures, and I noticed, because um, we have a couple of those, I believe those are Laotian or Hmong pieces that, that have been made. That, that culture also experiences domestic abuse and violence, but it's a cultural thing in terms of when we talk about men being in control of families. I got invited to a, a church, the priest, this was a Hispanic congregation, and what was going on was, because of the idea of the man's role in so many different cultures, the idea of what the man's role is, that the abuse was such that these families, this priest was saying, we, we got the police coming all the time, and when they come up, What's happening is they find out one parent is an illegal. So parent, one parent would be sent back to Mexico or whatever country it is. And if the children are born here, it was just really a mess. It was chaos. And people were being hurt. And people were being hurt. And so I spoke to the congregation. And we had cultural issues, generational issues, all kinds of things were going on. <coughs> it is really critical. It's really critical that we have these conversations. In my group, working with people who are offenders or batterers, I had a gentleman who was about 67 years old from Germany. And, so, and he was pretty new. He could speak good English, though. So when he came in the group, we asked him, well, what did you do? And he said, I beat my wife. And he said it as if this was really normal, and he didn't really understand what was going on, why. He was having so many problems, why he was now a part of our system. And so we tried to explain to him, in America, there are laws, there are things that we do, that we believe, that doesn't make that acceptable. Well, he missed his next couple of sessions, so I had to call his parole officer. Now think about this. This is somebody who probably came to this country looking for new opportunities, looking for something a little bit better for him and his family, and what happens he gets here, he doesn't fully understand our culture, and he gets arrested and now has a PO. It's important when we talk about doing mission work, all the things that we do, people have got to understand the way we function in this country. In one of my groups, I had a young man from France, all of 24 years old. He had some roommates, a couple of these roommates were girls, not girlfriends, but they were roommates. He and his roommates got into an argument, a serious dispute. The police were called. He now sits in my room, 23 weeks, has a PO. We've got to have the conversation. We've got to be able to talk about what is healthy, what are healthy relationships. Because there's such a misconception out 
in this society now about what's okay, what's not okay. This is important because people are not just hurting, but people are dying. And I think you would agree with me, one life lost is one life too many. When I, when I look at when one life is taken, all the people who are affected by that, we now have to get training on active shooter training. People coming to church with a gun. It is all about how do we interact with one another. And as Christians, we know how we're supposed to interact. We know what we should be doing. But the reality is for many people in their own personal relationships, this becomes a challenge. So the opportunity to get away, come to Sojourner Family Peace Center, the house, to call somebody on the phone and be able to talk to somebody, to be able to go to the court and get a restraining order. Anybody know what the maximum time a restraining order is? Except you. Do you know what the new time is? The maximum time used to be four years. Now they have, it's 10 years. 10 years? 10 years. That's a big leap from four to 10, right? That's a big leap. But it's because even after so many years, someone still is trying to engage this person in an unhealthy way, still trying to do them harm, still trying to make contact, and it's any number of things. Um, how many of you remember the story of Terry Jendusa Nikolai? That was the woman who was married uh, to this gentleman and then divorced, and her, her first husband came, kidnapped her, beat her, and put her in the barrel? This was after she was already remarried to somebody else. You know, this, this might feel like a hard conversation to have, but it's one we have to have because lives are being so greatly impacted. I worked with uh, a pastor in Burlington because there was a woman who, she was in an abusive relationship, she killed her husband. She actually had someone kill her husband. She had a person kill her husband and the, the mess that that situation created because she had no one to talk to in the beginning. So she's charged with murder, the kids, there were five kids, they're all scattered. This is why having these conversations, being able to talk about it is so critical. The way the system works now is that a person who is dealing with domestic abuse and violence, they can come to us through the shelter, they can call us on the hotline, they can go to the restraining order, they can come to us in any situation, any way. The only challenge is, right now, because of the HIPAA laws and privacy, no one can share information with anybody. So if they come to us, but they need to talk to the police, she or he has to go to the police, start the process all over again. If they need to go to somebody else, legal assistance, whoever, they start the process all over again. Every time they have to start the process all over again. And what people were saying is we keep re-victimizing these victims. And depending on the level of education and awareness that any particular group or person has, they may not be sensitive to what's happening with that particular person. There's a way that you have to talk to people who are victims. They, because if you want them to be able to help themselves, first we have to take away all the barriers that make it impossible. Yes, sir. Question for you. Is there some type of a way they can sign off on that information so it gets sent to the other agency so they don't have to relive that situation again? At this time, I don't believe so only because so many people start handling things, and so if stuff gets passed around all over the place, it's so hard to keep track of. And so there's not one system. Right now, we currently use, at our site, a system called Alice. Please don't ask me about technology. I'm lucky to be able to twit, and I don't even do that. <laughs> but we have a system called Alice, and I just watch their reaction when they're talking about putting information in Alice. Somebody else has a system over here and a system over there, and none of these things are compatible, so it's, it's, it's crazy. When we get to the new center, what's gonna happen is all of our services will be brought under the one roof. The shelter will be, up, we'll, the shelter will be there. We have a program called Family Advocacy and Support Services. Everybody doesn't need to be in the shelter, but they may need help. And so that FAST program, that will be there. So all of our programs will be under one roof, but we'll have partners 
who will also be there. The Milwaukee Police Department mm -hmm. will have someone there. Children's Hospital, the Pathology Department will have someone there. The Sexual Assault Treatment Center, because we also know that a lot of victims of domestic violence are also victims of sexual assault. They will be there. The Healing Center, they will be there. So all of these people that any victim may have contact with will be all under one roof. Our executive directors traveled around the country looking at different setups of Family Justice Center. And I am really excited and proud to say that we came up with one, or they came up with one, that we think will be the model for the rest of the country. You should say we, not they. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't at the table, but I'm definitely going to be doing my part, that's for sure. And I'm really excited because it's going to make such a difference. Families will be able to actually walk in off the street. Apparently, our shelter is confidential. So no, she, she or he could not just come to our shelter. Even if they came, and I always use myself as an example, they came to my house and they said, okay, Mrs. Fields, you need to, we'll take you to Sojourner Truth House. And I go there, the next day they need to talk to me, the police officers. So they show up at the shelter, they knock on the door, they say, may I speak to Deborah Fields, please? We dropped her off here last night. Do you know what they're going to tell them, the police officer? I'm sorry, but we cannot disclose who's here. Now think about that. The police officer just brought me here. He was doing his job. He's still doing his job. He's also trying to help, but because of the laws, and we respect the laws, he can't, they can't let him know that I am in the shelter. But once that new facility is there, we will share one system of information. And what I, the beauty of what I really love is when that person comes, we'll take her to an office space. And unlike when you go to the hospital, you have to follow the red line, the blue line, and the yellow line to get all those different things you have to do, she will go in one room and everyone she needs to talk to will come to her. Every person that she needs to see, whether it's law enforcement, the, the DA, whoever it is, they will come to her. There will be no, okay, now move your stuff and go here. Because it's important that, just like when we go to the hospitals, when we go to all these places to get help, the idea is, how do we make this as less traumatizing for the people as possible? So we're really excited about it. The, um, the project started out with a grant from, for $11 million, and Governor Scott Walker said, if you raise it, we'll match it. And we celebrated last week that we raised that money thanks to people, not just donations, but prayers. Prayers. Prayers that even if they didn't have the money, that somehow we would get the money. And people came through. Our executive director says she doesn't want this to just to be something that we did and then all of a sudden we're in trouble. She is making sure that not only do we have the money to start this project, but this project will continue. The people that we service or provide services for don't just come from Milwaukee. They come from all over. They come from all over. Racine, Beloit, all over, up north occasionally, other states, other states, because there are families that are on the run, people that are on the run, and they can't get the same service there. I had a lady, I was speaking at a business, and I had a lady come up to me and she said, you know, I really want to thank you and the people that you work with. I lived in, she named the state, her husband, who was so abusive to her, that her father, who was in the military, and he was a high-ranking person, couldn't even protect her. This man, because he understood technology, he knew how to track her. He knew where she was going. He knew all her family. So there was no, she had to literally run. So she went to a shelter in her state, and she said what they did was because they knew she was not safe there. They, they just flipped a coin, and it landed on Milwaukee, Wisconsin. <laughs> And she, yeah, <laughs> because she didn't have a place she wanted to go, and she needed to go somewhere totally new that he would never suspect. Which I kind of resent because people act like they don't know about Wisconsin. Or <laughs> <laughs> but we're famous for everything, so I'm not so good. But we're we're famous for a lot of good things as well. And I am so happy that this will be one of the things that we actually believe that people will be coming to us to say we would like to see how you're doing this how you're making a difference in the lives of families dealing with domestic abuse and violence. I train with hospitals to help them to understand because so many families, the victims are winding up in the emergency rooms. 
Regular, ordinary people like us don't always hear anything or what a picture looks like until there's something on television, something in the news, and then we, it may spark our interest. Some people have gotten a hold of us because they've heard presentations or they buy our cards, different things like that. But it's important that we understand there's a social issue that we really need to talk about. Marquette does a good job of holding classes, informational sessions for the students. I've been a part of that, some of those information sessions about students and the issue of domestic violence. I've even gone into some of their classes. UWM does the same thing. Our college campuses are talking about it. Last week, it was, it was um, Denim Day. Anybody familiar with what Denim Day is? No. I saw that. <clears throat> Denim Day celebrates this woman who um, was severely sexually assaulted and they didn't file charges against her rapist because she was wearing blue jeans and because her blue jeans were so tight, she had to help take them off. And they said because she had to help take off the jeans, it was not rape. Mm. Again, this is not about shock therapy, but this is about why we need to have conversations, why we need to be talking to our young people, our young kids, because believe it or not, stuff is happening. I got invited to one of the suburban schools because they wanted to do this wonderful volunteer project. It was a sixth grade class, and this is what the teacher said to me. She said, now, Deborah, when you come to talk about Sojourner Truth House, I only want you to talk about the good work that you do there. I don't want you to talk about why those women and children are there. Because this doesn't happen in our communities. And our children, and, and I'm telling you what she said, and of course I'm on the phone and I'm thinking, I love my job, I can do what you're asking me to do, but boy, oh boy. So I go to the sixth grade class, and I'm telling them with this smile on my face about how much these children are going to love these things they've collected. So, and one little boy raises his hand. And he says, Mrs. Fields. And he asks me a question. And the next thing I know, all the kids' hands are shooting up. And they've all got questions. They've all seen things. They've all heard things. They've all had experiences. And I'm like, OK. So I look at the teacher. And her, her jaw's literally <laughs> down here now. I'm like, Where would you like me to go with this? But of course, we talk to the children in an age-appropriate conversation. But it's the idea we cannot hide these things from our kids because our kids are growing up. They're entering into relationships. The statistics say that children who witness domestic violence, 50% of them are likely to become either victims or perpetrators. We've got to be having the conversation. We have the conversation of don't hit your brother, don't hit your sister, because I told you so, it's not nice. But we've got to have more in-depth conversation. Yes. Yeah. A question. Um, now, I gathered from things you said, you also work with abusers when you have the opportunity. Um, what do you do with them, and what rate of success are you finding to turn them around so they don't abuse anymore? Thank you very much for your question. So let me say, let me start by saying, when you say I have the opportunity, I have a lot of opportunity, a lot. Sojourner Family Peace Center, we operate 13 groups. Each group is about 17 people in a group. Two of them are women's groups. Women are being arrested as perpetrators of domestic abuse and violence. So when they come, what we look at is, okay, first, I check the police report or the record that whoever sent them there, why did they send them there, okay? Then when they're in group, we ask them, who and what got you here? Because I'm listening for, okay, how does what they say compare to what's written on paper, mm -hmm. okay? Because we have to work both of those, because there's truth in both of those. I've come to learn that, yes, it's a police report, but the police are reporting certain things in a certain way, and the person who's actually in this has their own perception. So then we look at that, and what we're looking for is for them to take responsibility for their behavior. Now this is 90% of what we'll get. She made me hit her. She made me do this. If she would have, I just, I wouldn't have had you, okay? Did you have any other options, any other choices? Gotta think about it for a minute. Yes, I could. And I tell them, even if it meant you had to jump out of a window, was that an option? Yes, it was an option. So taking responsibility is one. 
looking at why they do what they do, okay? Because we say it's a learned behavior. No child is born being mean or abusive or any of that kind of stuff. People learn these behaviors. I've had men say to me, but you know, I grew up in a home and my parents didn't do any of these things and everything was okay. So where do you learn the behavior? From community, from peers, learn it on your own. I tell young women when I'm talking in classes, the first time someone slaps you or hits you or pushes you and you don't say anything, the message is they can do this and it's not a problem. I've spoken to young people and they've come from all backgrounds and I've had them say things that you would have sworn this was like the 1940s or 1920s. Well, girls should do this and girls should behave a certain way. I'm thinking, wow, okay, where did you learn that from? So we're having to teach that, all of these things. Unlike when I was in school, we had etiquette classes and all the home ec that taught you so many things. If you're not getting it at church, then home is the only other place. And not everybody is in church. So we as a society have got to be having these conversations. We're looking for them to take responsibility, to admit what they've done, their specific behavior. And that includes the women. That absolutely includes the women. What did you do? Well, I got mad and I ran over his whatever, his laptop, or I hit him with a bottle or whatever they did. Um, and then, where did you learn this behavior? What's the particular thing that they do? Not everybody does the same thing. And see, that's the other thing. A lot of people don't know that if you're having an argument, a verbal argument, and it's ugly, and the police get called, you can get charged with domestic violence disorderly conduct. <clears throat> that's not hurting anybody physically, but you can get charged with it. We've got to have these conversations. I had an older woman come. You remember the big oxygen tanks, that, those big ones that they used to drag on its own little trolley? Mm -hmm. She was coming across the door. My first thought when I saw her was, because she was only about this high, and the thing was as big as she was. Mm. I'm thinking, you can hardly breathe. What could you have possibly done to get you in trouble? Her and her husband got into an argument, got into a fight, and it got so roaring good, she actually picked that oxygen tank up and threw it through the door. <laughs> She picked that oxygen tank up and threw it through the door. She didn't throw it at him. It didn't touch him. But they charged her with domestic violence, disorderly conduct, and whatever else. De uh, destruction of property. Hmm. And so she had to come see me for 23 weeks, dragging her oxygen tank. <laughs> We've got to have the conversation. We've got to be open. Are you finding this. that there's a lot of success dealing with these abusers? I'll be very honest with you, there's no real study. Uh, there's no requirement for a real study. So I would say, yes, there is success. I cannot honestly stand here and tell you how much success. But I know that the work we're doing is good when I can see the light bulb go off. Do we have people that reoffend? Yes. And when they reoffend, they come back and see me for another 23 weeks. And that's why when they first come to me, I tell, me, I tell them, let's get this right the first time. Because they, they come in resistant, they come in angry, they've been ordered to do this. They have, this is the only program the state requires, they have to pay. Mm. So they're mad because they now have to come see me for 23 weeks, they can't miss a beat. If they've got a job, they've got to tell their employer, mm. I need to leave my job to go do this. Well, what are you doing? I have to go to a bachelor's program. Mm. Then they have to pay for it. So that first couple of sessions, they're angry. Some of them come in and they get it. And we, can, and we work, others come in and they try to play the game for 23 weeks. They wind up going out and doing something else and then they're back seeing me again. But I tell them when they come, I'm happy to see you. I don't care how you got here, you're gonna be the change agent. You're gonna be the ones to help make a difference. We have a curriculum that we use. All the research on domestic violence was originally done in Duluth, Minnesota. And so we use what everybody calls the Duluth model. And so we, we work with that. Our women offenders, women tend not to be quite as physically violent. What they do is they, when they do physical violence, it's on the extreme end. They stab, they cut, they shoot. They don't necessarily beat up a man. Most women are not gonna step to a man that way. But they destroy property. 
in the heat of anger, anybody can be capable of doing anything. In the heat of anger, anyone is capable of doing anything, even things they think they would never do. This is why we've got to be educated and trained. When we get together in the Family Justice Center, I'm hoping that we'll see a lot more education going on. Um, they're gonna let me be in charge of community education, so I'm gonna be inviting everybody. Come in, learn, learn, learn. I go out, and that's good. And people will even say to me, why don't they have this in the schools? Well, think about what they look for in schools now in, types of, in terms of courses and classes. They want those types of classes that help people get jobs. And so what they call soft skills are only now starting to resurface because they're starting to see so many human behavior problems. So now they're looking for more soft skills courses. But again, who's going to pay for that? So places like Sojourner Family Peace Center and other agencies and other programs are doing that work. Are there any other questions? We have just about a few minutes about the programs, volunteer opportunities, yes? Uh, I have the impression that restraining orders don't work very well. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. And this is our response. In the beginning of this movement of domestic violence, the advocates would tell women, get a uh, restraining order. But what they found out, the most dangerous time for a woman is when she's trying to leave. And so if she got a restraining order and you got to serve it to him, that was, that was one way he knew that she was trying to leave. So more women were being killed when they were trying to leave. The other thing is that for the person who has nothing to lose, you're right, a restraining order won't mean anything. If I don't have a job or I don't care about the job, I have nothing and I just nothing but my anger and my pain, right, restraining order won't work for them. But we make sure that we help the, help the victim with a safety plan. What can we make sure, how can we make sure that you're safe, depending on how you want to live your life. Some victims, it takes anywhere from six to eight times before they finally decide they really want to do something different. They try to live their lives as normal as possible, but they're still struggling with the fact that this person who says they love me is doing things that's totally contrary to that. And so, but for the person who, you know what, they've got a job, they don't, they're, they're pretty much a law-abiding person, all that, the restraining order will work. It works. Or if they have fear of systems and law enforcement, it works. But you do have those individuals who a restraining order won't work, and we know that. And we don't tell women now to get a restraining order because a part of the assessment is, if you get one, what will happen? Do you think it will help you? But also, the purpose of getting one is, a lot of times, a partner will kidnap the kids. So the restraining order helps also to protect the kids. Because if the kids are going to school, the restraining order has their name on it, those kids can only be released to whoever she says they can be released to. So it's always trying to look at how do we protect people. And people are always going to find ways to try to beat the system. Good question for you. You talked about the, um, the computer system and getting together as a group. What's the timing on this, where you're all working together? Well, um, they say we'll be moving in in December, so I'm thinking it's a coordinated plan, because they already know all the things they have to do. And so I'm quite sure they're already engaged, and IT people are already engaged in conversations with all of these, and they're trying to figure out what one system can they all use that will still, can we all use that will still be helpful. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure they're doing this all along, because once they start installing everything, we don't want to have a whole lot of time for oops, mistakes, and you know, trying to refigure that. So I, it's my belief that they're going to be coordinate this, coordinating this all along the way. Yes, sir. Well, well first of all, there's a, I think there's a good edit letter to the editor today about the effects of all these things, not just domestic abuse, but poverty and all these different mm -hmm. things on children. Mm -hmm. um, but, and, but I assume that there's a certain amount of um, you were saying that you can't tell people who's there uh, at your facility. That, so there's a certain amount of secrecy, you know, you can't. So how do people find out about you? I guess it's, this is the bottom oh, line. No, absolutely. Um, they call any 911, 9112141. They'll tell you about the shelter. Okay. But what happens is if, they, if you call inquiry, we'll always have to talk to the person who might want to come in because we don't give out the address until we're talking to the person. So even if she's at the hospital in the emergency room and say the nurse calls, we'll still ask to speak to her. 
And when she wants to come in, we arrange. If she doesn't have a car, we make the arrangements. But on the phone, we'll tell her, you cannot disclose this address. I give tours all the time, and it's so funny. I give tours, and I tell the people, because they say, what's the address? Then I have to tell them, but you can't share the address. But I'm giving five people the address. So it's, all, it's always kind of weird. But the whole idea that even if people show up, if you're familiar with the way some of the old homes in Milwaukee are designed, those doors are at least three inch thick, and we have two of them. Um, women have a curfew, so they can only come and go between the hours of eight and eight without us knowing about it. It's for their own safety. We have a rule that if you, if you break the um, confidentiality, then we're gonna ask you to leave. Now, that sounds harsh, but we don't just say get out. We don't let them leave without making sure they're going to a safe situation. So it may be another shelter, which is our first thought. We'll take, send you to another shelter, or we may send you to uh, some relative's home or whatever. Now, it's kind of like school. Depending on how bad the situation or the offense is, they get like an expulsion, 90 days. Because we know that if without help, they're going to come back. So it's not a you're out and you can never come back. It's, okay, see, you broke the rules and you put everybody in an unsafe situation. So you got to leave, we're going to help you, but, but they can always come back. And so we have rules around it. Once we get the new center, even that, even how we're going to design, do we need to have bulletproof glass and all of that? And all of the workers said, no, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. We don't want to create a situation that puts so much distance between us. And so, um, trusting in God, we, we believe in the work that we do, so we feel we'll be okay. But you always going to have somebody that's going to try to push it. So. Do you have scholarships for those people who can't afford to pay? There's no cost. The only program they have to pay for is the batter's treatment program. Otherwise, all of our services and programs are free. If she needs to have her locks changed, we'll have her, we'll get her locks changed. We work with other agencies, legal uh, agencies that provide uh, very low cost fees or no fees at all to help with wherever there's a legal situation. Yes. What about verbal abuse? Uh, do you run across that very often? Uh, is it always a lie with physical abuse? Or no. are some people really masters at verbal abuse? My impression is that when you have women abusing a man, it's more verbal abuse than physical. And, and I actually, that's my way of teaching, because I say women could not pick up a weapon or do anything physical to a man because she could always, that was always cause for her to be punished right off the gate. So women had to match the words. And so yes, women tend to be very verbally abusive, but at the same time, um, it's quite, not quite the same as when you're looking that up to someone and putting someone in a position of being your, your supporter, your all of these things, because the whole idea of men's and women's relationships come into that. But things, again, are changing, because a lot of the men will say, she put me down, she never lifts me up, she makes me feel bad, and all these things. And after so many, so verbal abuse, even with young people, a lot of verbal abuse, a lot of verbal abuse. And they don't even know what it is. When they use language that, because it's on TV, they think it's not a problem. And I say, but it is. When you use these words, it is. And, and that's usually where it's, and I always tell them, that's your pink flag. Right there, with the way people talk to each other, that's an indicator of how this might go. So you want to be careful about how you let somebody talk to you, the words they use, both men and women. And, and the unique thing I found about men, men stay in unhealthy relationships for the same re reasons women do. It, that really amazed me. I love her. Um, she's the mother of my children. I don't want to leave. I, I'm holding out hope. Again, we can't dispute the statistics, but I just I always say I wish all these groups could see each other and maybe they get it because everybody's doing all this hurting out of pain and yet they're pointing fingers and blaming versus how do we turn this situation around and interact with each other so that we all feel good and healthy. Well, I think that's our time. So I appreciate you this morning. I ask that you would please pray for us as we continue the work. We've been talking about secondary trauma, the people that actually do the work and what we're experiencing. And now we're dealing with the whole sex trafficking, which is a whole other major issue. A whole other issue that the community is being educated about. 
but every day you have people that are in the trenches doing the work, that are hearing these stories repeatedly, and they're also being affected by it. So please pray for us, pray for our agency, victims and survivors, and the offenders, that their lives will change as well. Thank you so much, and have a blessed day. Thank you. Thank you.